Hello and welcome to the Biological Resources Information Program for the Cunningham Flood Detention Facility Certification Project. This presentation is provided by Alluvian Biological Consulting. This training has four broad objectives. Hopefully by the end of this presentation you'll be familiar with all four of these points. First, we're going to cover the definition and implications of take, and then we'll move on to what your responsibilities are if you encounter a regulated species. We'll have a brief introduction to the protected species associated with this project, and then we'll go over some general mitigation measures that need to be followed in order to prevent any incidents of take. So let's talk a little bit about take. Take is a very broadly defined term. California has a different definition for it than the federal government does, but they're both very similar. So for the federal definition, take means to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. California's definition is to hunt, pursue, catch, capture, or kill, or attempt to do any such actions. They're very, very similar, and they both mean pretty much the same thing. Anything that constitutes harassment or more is going to qualify as take. Uh, and the reason that it's important for you to know what take is, is because take of listed or regulated species can carry some pretty hefty penalties. Criminal penalties can go as high as $50,000 and up to a year in jail time in some instances. And civil penalties can get almost as high as the criminal penalties financially. So it's incredibly important that you know what take is and you avoid take as much as you possibly can so you can avoid these penalties. So before I introduce you to some of these listed and regulated species that we might encounter on the project, the first thing we need to go over is what your responsibilities are if you see one of these species. First and foremost, do not touch or approach the listed or regulated species. Can't stress that enough. Second thing on the list, if the species is in the immediate project area and is at risk of being injured or killed, you need to stop work immediately. What needs to happen then is you need to notify the designated biologist or the biological monitor. If one of us isn't there, if the monitor is not present, you need to contact Alluvian Biological Consulting directly. The phone number is in each of your books and it's here on the presentation. The principal biologist on this project is Gennaro Lockhart. Only a qualified and permitted biologist can handle and move regulated species from the project site. So now let's look at the listed and regulated species that may occur on or near the project site. Northwestern pond turtle is a medium sized turtle. The color ranges anywhere between brown to olive brown to blackish, and the shell is going to be anywhere between three and a half to eight and a half inches long. The species can be identified from the lines and spots that radiate from the center of the scoots, and the scoots are the bony plates that make up the shell of this animal. Males of this species tend to have a light throat and no markings, and a relatively flat shell, and females are going to have dark markings around their throat and have a noticeably taller shell. The species typically inhabits ponds and creeks, and hibernates underwater for several months during the winter. Western pond turtles reach breeding age at about 8 to 10 years of age. Uh, breeding usually takes place in April and May, and what females will do is they'll climb onto land on the water margin and dig a nest. They'll lay a clutch of around 2 to 11 eggs, and those eggs will gestate for about 80 to 100 days before they'll hatch. Dusky-footed wood rat is a medium-sized rodent measuring 8 to 10 inches in body length, not including the 8 to 10 inch tail. Their fur is grayish brown with a white underbelly and gray fur on the top sides of their feet. The San Francisco dusky-footed wood rat is found throughout the San Francisco Bay and Santa Cruz Mountains. They prefer oak and chaparral habitat, and wood rats build large, complex stick house structures which are closely associated with either tree roots, shrubs, hollow logs, and tree limbs. These structures usually come equipped with nest chambers, food larders, escape tunnels, and even latrines. And a single wood rat may tend multiple houses at once. 
This species gives birth to two to three pups per year, which the female will carry on her belly until they've developed to the sufficient size. Western burrowing owl is a small, brown, mottled owl that stands about seven to nine inches in height. True to its name, the burrowing owl nests in a hole in the ground. Although it's quite willing to dig its own burrow, it often uses one that's already provided by prairie dogs, skunks, ground squirrels, or other wildlife. Burrowing owls require habitat with open, well-drained terrain, short, sparse vegetation, and underground burrows. During the breeding season, they may also need enough permanent cover and taller vegetation within their foraging range to provide them with sufficient prey. Because of this, burrowing owls can occupy a wide range of habitats, including grasslands, agricultural areas, urban vacant lots, as well as the margins of airports. Breeding in California can start as early as January and continue through September. The peak of breeding is in April. Burrowing owls can lay anywhere between 1 to 11 eggs. The, the young hatch in about 30 days and fledge after 45 days. They will remain at the burrow for some time, foraging at night with the adults, until they're ready to fledge on their own. White-tailed kite is a medium-sized raptor, 13 to 15 inches in length, with a long white tail, a gray back, and white facial feathers. Adults have red eyes, while juveniles have yellow eyes, and all individuals have a distinctive black spot beneath each wing wrist, in addition to a sharply hooked beak. White-tailed kites may inhabit a wide range of habitats, including savanna, marshes, cultivated lands, desert, and woodlands. The species feeds almost exclusively on small mammals, and in California, white-tailed kites are commonly associated with agricultural lands. They frequently nest on the tops of trees and stands adjacent to open foraging area. Mating takes place from February to October, and clutch size typically ranges from four to five eggs. With an incubation period of 28 to 32 days, chicks usually fledge after about 38 days. Tricolored blackbird is a medium-sized passerine bird with a conical beak, usually anywhere between 7 to 9 inches long. Male breeding plumage is almost entirely black, but they do carry a distinctive red shoulder patch bordered with white fringe. This species is found throughout the Central Valley and a few coastal environments within and south of Sonoma County. Tricolored blackbirds can be found nesting in freshwater wetland vegetation as well as agricultural fields. Their diet consists primarily of insects and seeds. This species forms the largest nesting colonies of any passerine bird, with a 10-acre area containing between 50 to 20,000 nests. Nests are built in dense vegetation with plenty of cover, and breeding takes place from May to July. Females rear up to two broods of four chicks per nesting season, and incubation lasts up to two weeks with another two weeks required for nestlings to fledge. This section applies to all of the bird species that has been previously covered and any other species covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act or California Department of Fish and Wildlife Fish and Game Code 3503. A variety of bird species have been found nesting in or immediately adjacent to Caltrans right-of-ways. Nest sites are often placed in crevices, cavities, seams, or weep holes within bridges. Other nests are constructed on open vertical cement surfaces on bridges. The species that utilize man-made structures as nest sites tend to be more tolerant of urban conditions. These conditions might be increased noise, light, vibration, or simply human presence, but they can nonetheless be sufficiently disturbed during construction or maintenance activities enough to cause nest abandonment or inattentiveness, which would result in the death or loss of eggs or juveniles. Incubation and brood rearing require approximately four to five weeks for smaller birds, but can take up to 12 weeks for larger raptors. And this is why it's incredibly important that we get nest deterrence up on the project site and prevent nesting as soon and as often as possible. Roosting bats are protected by California Department of Fish and Wildlife Code 4150. And many of the habitats and structures associated with Caltrans right-of-ways have been found to be inhabited by bats. 
A total of 18 species of bats have been found to use bridges in California in one way or another. Roosts are places that provide security and protection where bats can rest, sleep, hibernate, mate, socialize, or feed. Roosts can take many forms and may be found in rock crevices, gaps in concrete or steel structures, trees, bridge weep holes, and many others. Bats prefer to roost in places that are in close proximity to their open foraging grounds. In many cases, you won't see bats in their roosts, but you will see traces of guano and bat droppings outside of these roost crevices, so this is something you should look out for on your job site. So now we're going to go over some of the species protection measures for this project. This won't be an exhaustive list of all of the species protection measures for this project, but just a summary of some of the important points. A full list of the species protection measures for this project can be found in your Biological Resources Information Program booklet, so please reference your booklet for the rest of those measures. If a listed or regulated species shows up on or near the project site, we'll need to set up a protective radius for it. The radius is a no-work buffer that needs to remain in place until the animal leaves the area. And for this project, all regulated species carry a radius of 100 feet unless otherwise noted in this table. There are several general protective measures that need to be followed on this project. I'll go over these quickly, but you should review these measures in your training materials. First of all, all wildlife should be allowed to leave the job site unharmed, and this includes any animals that don't carry state or federal protections. On top of this, to prevent wildlife entrapment on the project, all excavations, and this includes trenches, holes, and pits, as well as all pipes and hoses, need to be covered at the end of each workday. If covering an excavation is not practical, earthen or wooden escape ramps need to be installed every 15 feet along the exposed excavation. Additionally, all food-related waste generated on the site needs to be contained in sealed trash containers. These containers need to be removed from the site daily, and the reason for this is because food waste tends to attract wildlife, and wildlife on a project site could ultimately cause delays. The next three points will help avoid more indirect effects on wildlife. And starting with the environmentally sensitive areas, um, ESA fencing should be up to mark all of the sensitive areas near the project. No work is allowed in these areas, and if the ESA fencing is knocked over or damaged for any reason, it needs to be repaired immediately. Also, during construction operations, stockpiling of construction materials, portable equipment, vehicles, and supplies needs to be restricted to the designated construction staging areas. These areas must be located in upland habitat and may not cover riparian vegetation or leave material where it may be washed into a water body. And as always on projects like this, best management practices need to be employed in any instance where there's a risk of discharging sediment or hazardous materials into the soil or a nearby water body. All BMPs should be inspected immediately before and immediately after storms. Discharge of sediment into water bodies is strictly prohibited. On top of the general protection measures of this project, we also have some project specific considerations. The most important of these is the in-water work window for Flint Creek and Lower Silver Creek, which is restricted to May 1st through October 15th. This window represents the dry season in California. Specific construction activities outlined in the Streambed Alteration Agreement may be conducted outside of these dry season dates, but no matter the season, no equipment or vehicle should be operated or driven in streams, ponds, or any other wetted areas. So we'll finish up here with some important takeaways from this presentation. First of all, back to the beginning, do not touch or approach any regulated species. Please notify your biological monitor if you see a regulated species on the project. And again, active bird nests are most likely to be found from February 15th to August 31st during the nesting season. It's incredibly important that you stay within the designated construction zone and you use the designated staging areas for this project. And please report all incidents to the biological monitor or your supervisor. 
Again, no hazardous waste, pollutants, or debris should be allowed to enter a water body. And this goes hand in hand with maintaining BMPs on the project site to prevent erosion and sediment loss. Lastly, and most importantly, you and your company are wholly responsible for following the measures that are stated in not only this biological resource information video, but the permits and specifications for this project. I appreciate you following along with this presentation. Uh, if you have any questions about what's been covered in this presentation, your training materials, the permits, project specifications, please direct them to your on-site alluvian biologist.